Welcome and thanks for joining us for Two Steps Forward, our daily Bible study. I'm James. This is my wife, Aid. We are back to both being able to study this time. This is actually, I think it was only just the one time in Joshua. Mm -hmm. that, uh, mm -hmm. It just had to be me flying solo. But we are up to episode 362 and today we are going to be covering three chapters. Trust me, you'll thank me when you, like it sounds like a lot at first, but um, the chapters in the latter part of Joshua, except for the very last one, it, are pretty, like it's it's like allotting land and talking about battles and, and um, I, I think we, it's, it makes sense to push them together. So we're gonna look, be looking at Joshua 13 through 15 today for episode 362. Anything before we get started? Mm -hmm. hey, no? All right. So make sure if you haven't done so yet, read through Joshua 13, 14, 15. I'm going to summarize them all uh, in order right here to get us started. So Joshua 13, uh, God told Joshua that he's old, but there's still lots of land that needs to be taken. So God reminded Joshua that God himself would drive the people, the uh, Sidonians here, out from these mountain regions and divide this land as an inheritance for nine tribes and the half tribe of Manasseh. We're reminded that the Reubenites, Gadites, and half Man uh, the other half of Manasseh uh, had already received their inheritance, so none of this new land would end up going to them. We're also reminded that there were some groups like Geshur and Makah that the Israelites failed to drive out. This is an important refrain when we get to the book of Judges eventually. Um, actually, we've already studied Judges, but uh, one of the things that we find there is the Israelites have problems for failing to drive out the people, the Canaanites. The Levites inherited no land because their inheritance was the food of the offerings presented to the Lord, although we will get to some cities that they received uh, uh, for them. Joshua 14 then says, the Israelites divided the land uh, as God commanded through Moses west uh, of the Jordan. Special considerations were given for Levites. Again, they had cities with pastures for their flocks, but no larger plots of land. And uh, we're given the reminder that Joseph had two divisions. This is how you come to still having 12 tribes, even though Levi doesn't actually have a um, Mm -hmm. specific location. Joseph's family is divided into Ephraim and Manasseh based on his two sons. Uh, Caleb from the tribe of Judah came and reminded Joshua how he had been unique in trusting God 40 years earlier as a spy. And at that time, Moses promised to him the land on which he was standing, which uh, you can go back and read that on Deuteronomy 1, uh, 36, 1 verse 36. So Caleb now asks for his land and he's 85 years old which would still require driving out uh, the Anakites, some very large warriors from that space, but Caleb's up for it. This land stayed in Caleb's family and was called Hebron. And finally, that brings us to Joshua 15. Uh, very carefully, the boundaries of the tribe of Joshua are traced far down into the south end of Canaan. Caleb drove out the Anakite descendants from his region in Judah. Again, it's called Hebron. Uh, he also had promised his daughter and the fields uh, and the springs in Negev in marriage to a man named Athniel because he defeated the Anakites at Kiriath Sefer. We're then given a list of dozens of towns in Judah, but um, for whatever reason, the Israelites were not able to dislodge the Jebusites in Jerusalem at this time, so they continued to live with the Israelites uh, in Jerusalem. All right, that is Joshua 13, 14, and 15. Anything before we get started? Um, so it's interesting that you said here, so the Levites inherited no land. Their inheritance was the food of the offering. Yeah. In my Bible, it says their allotment came from the offerings burned on the altar. Yeah. Um, and the priest that I listened to read the Bible to me, he mm -hmm. is, he really likes to say probably because it like hits close to home for him because he's taken a vow of poverty but mm -hmm. he really likes to say that the levites that god he, he apparently translates this as like god was their inheritance like they got a special relationship or like a special portion of god's presence yeah and that was their inheritance that god himself yeah, I mean, they, the fact of the matter is they did get provisions from the animal sacrifices at the temple and the tabernacle. So that that was, I mean, it's it's one of those things like saying God is God is all I need is both true and you actually need daily food. 
mm-hmm. because that's the way God designed you to be. You know, like God is all I need, but you also need friends in your life because that's the way God designed you. Mm-hmm. So yes, God is their inheritance in a special sense. They get the offerings, the, those offerings that go to God, go to the Levites. That's how they make their income. Um, but uh, they do get the practical. Practically, you still have to be clothed and fed and, and that sort of thing. So was every Levite a priest? No. So what, uh, what do the ones who aren't priests get? Yeah, they get. They also get paid through these offerings, but they are like the temple workers. And we'll oh. look at, uh, we'll see a little bit of how things get divided up amongst them, like the Kohathites and the Merorites. And uh, they, they, like even the way they set up around camp, um, they all are located in proximity to the tabernacle and then later the temple. What are the Kohathites? sites and well, Marianites. We will get to them. It's so the ancestors of Aaron um, oh. and are the priestly class and in the, they're in the tribe of Levi. Mm-hmm. But all of the tribe of Levi is uh, professional workers for the Lord. But only the specific group ends up being the priests. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, we will talk about them actually a little bit more in some of the, uh, the later chapters of Joshua. Mm-hmm. But for now, devotional thought number one, uh, Inherit versus purchase and rent versus own. So I want you to take notice of the words that are used to describe the Israelites' occupancy of the promised land. Uh, the Israelites' relationship to the promised land, are the, the words describing it are very much similar to the way, uh, for instance, the New Testament describes our uh, salvation. Um, it's not something we earn. It's not something we deserve. It's not something we win. It's not... You know, it's gifted to us, and in some respects, we don't own it, but it's shared with us. So the words that are chosen here for the Israelites' occupancy, it creates a tension that is necessary. So like inheritance, it's used 55 times in verses 30, 13 uh, through, I'm sorry, chapters 13 through 21. Um, it never, it doesn't really say they won the land. It doesn't say they purchased the land. The Lord owned it and he leased it to his children for the price of obedience. Mm-hmm. Said, it's my land. As long as you are keep my are faithful with my laws, you will be you will own the land and you will be productive in the land. This is also the reason why they had a year of jubilee in which they had to give back. I think that sounds a little unfair to us that they had to, there were times when they had to give back land that you know, like if, if I had acquired a bunch of land over the course of 50 years, mm-hmm. at the in the year of Jubilee, after seven Sabbath years, mm-hmm. which are every seven years, at the end of those 50 years, I have to give back the land to the original family owners. Mm-hmm. And I think to us, that sounds unfair. No, I actually think it sounds like it gives you a more temporary feeling of the stuff you own. That's the idea. And part of the idea is the this land is temporal. Mm-hmm. And the, another part of the idea is this land isn't actually yours. Mm-hmm. It's God's. So God can shuffle it back wherever he wants. You are a manager, not an owner. Mm-hmm. And so it's a really healthy concept for the Israelites to bear in mind. This is God's land, not our land. And uh, it, again, it's similar. In, it's not a one-to-one comparison with our concepts of salvation. But um, we don't earn it. We don't deserve it. It's promised to us. It's purchased for us. Uh, and yet we also can forfeit it. Mm-hmm. You know. So I think in those ways, it's, it, there's a similarity or comparison. Uh, how does the understanding, my question for you here is, how does the understanding that all blessing uh, belongs to God? Mm-hmm. Every blessing we have belongs to God. Uh, how does that transform the way you manage blessings in life? It's I, I feel like it's it is tougher today to view it all as God's because so they're just like they're just given this land, mm-hmm. but you're not just like given your house, right? Like you actually have to earn the money to get your house. Yeah, I don't know. I think for us today we. A comparison would be like you're given God's given you the opportunities to be in a position to buy a house mm-hmm. but that's so intangible um, that I think it's more difficult today to be like oh yeah this is all God's because you there are certain steps you have to go through to acquire things more so than like just being given the land I wonder if you lived in India and you heard you talking right now if you would feel the same way about that like, it's you were just given this stuff 
you know, yes, it's it's like not ever, America has been really unique in the fortune and privilege of like, yes, you can get a massive loan from a bank. Mm -hmm. You can have uh, largely free uh, quality education. Uh -huh. You can have what? all of these opportunities. My education was not free. Yours might have been. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like we have a public education system that is you know better like for whatever one people want to knock it's better than a lot of people in the world have access mm -hmm. to um you don't have to go to work at 14 years old to make sure that the family mm -hmm. has food that's what i'm saying so to say i worked for it i bought my house i'm saying mm -hmm. ah. i that's what i'm saying though i acknowledge there are certain circumstances outside of my control that god has blessed me with to be in that position mm -hmm. including where you're born but those things are again somewhat intangible mm-hmm and also, like, so normalized yeah. that, like, everyone goes to school. You know, I'm not saying it isn't a blessing, but you don't... I think it's just harder to recognize the I, blessings and recognize everything as God's, the way we're set up in the United States. Well, again, this is why the Israelites needed constant reminders. They set up monuments for reminders. Mm -hmm. They had regular... Uh, their worship services were designed to remind them. And they were also supposed to, uh, to some, again, drive out the people who thought everything was a matter of self-empowerment. Mm -hmm. The people who had the gods of this world around them. And they, the longer they go on, the more comfortable they get, the more they continue to fall into look like, look at what we did. Mm -hmm. You know, like that was, I mean, from, it's, it's such, a, it's so built into human nature that they defeat Jericho miraculously. And the very next battle, which was AI, mm -hmm. they go and say, like, we can handle this. Mm -hmm. Right? Look at what we did last time. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you didn't do anything. You know, God did that. So there's this default to wanting to plagiarize credit from God. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I think the, the only way, I think when people get really generous with their blessings, it's when they understand it's not actually their, it, it's blessings to them. It's not just their stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it's God's stuff that we're just trying to manage faithfully. Devotional thought number two. Uh, the dangerous fringes of faith is what I'm going to call it. Um, so, again, we have this kind of unique situation where there's two and a half tribes, the half tribe of Manasseh, Reuben and Gad, who agreed to help the Israelites, the other tribes, conquer the promised land in Canaan, and yet, nonetheless, they desired to return to the eastern side of the Jordan River and receive that as their inheritance. Uh, if you go all the way back to Numbers 32, it says that they requested this land from Moses before they ever got here. Uh, because apparently, for whatever reason, the land east of the Jordan River was uniquely good for raising cattle in, and that's what they wanted to do. Uh, Moses granted the request, but we nonetheless have to acknowledge that it's a little bizarre that they requested a portion outside of what God originally defined as the boundaries for the promised land. Like, here's where I'm going to um, give you. And they're like, can we have this on the other side of the, you know, like it's a little bizarre. God grants the request. Moses grants the request. However, what they end up becoming, and we know this as their history plays out, is they end up becoming a little bit of a buffer between the heathen nations of Moab and Ammon uh, towards the Israelites. And they became uh, essentially uh, influenced, unfortunately, and uh, spiritually influenced and physically uh, oppressed to some extent by the Moabites and Ammonites. So if you read First Chronicles 5, 25 and 26, it says these tribes were unfaithful to, to the God of their ancestors, and they prostituted themselves to the gods of the peoples of the land whom God had destroyed before them. So uh, the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Pul, king of Assyria, which is King uh, tiglath Pileser of Assyria, who took the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh into exile. What we're learning here is a, a reiteration of the point that we saw back in Genesis 13 with Lot. Um, remember when Lot goes and he choose, chooses this plain that is really fertile mm -hmm. for his flocks, but it's right near Sodom. Mm -hmm. And God doesn't say it's wrong, but it very clearly ends up being unwise. Was the land they received inferior though? So like I heard in a commentary that their people group was too big. Their tribe was too big for the land they'd gotten. And also their land was like forest. Mm -hmm. Like it just wasn't great yeah, so we're actually going to talk about, in the next couple of chapters, we get this request from some leaders that say we don't have enough land. Mm -hmm. And it specifically addresses this. 
So the answer is no, they had sufficient land. Mm -hmm. Um, And they were both kind of complaint. The Manasseh, uh, so Ephraim and Manasseh are sort of notorious for being complainy and um, wimpy. Mm -hmm. Like they don't want to do the work to drive out the giants from their land. Mm -hmm. And they want to just complain that they didn't get enough stuff. So that's not completely what this is. It's uh, a little bit reasons we don't understand, but we know it has something to do with the quality of the land. Mm -hmm. So, um, Can you think of examples? So like the phrase that I want to use here, and I've heard used here, is believers on the border. Mm -hmm. So like, are they believers? Are they God's people? Yes. Are they unnecessarily putting themselves in danger by their proximity Mm -hmm. to the world? Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, can you think of examples of ways that, you know, applications of ways Christians could maybe still do this today? Um, I talk about this a lot, um, but like the group of people I work with, mm-hmm. because they have worked in a field for however long where they're making a high income, mm-hmm. the things in my head that I perceive as needs are, if I... S- if I only let the people I work with influence me, become my needs become so ridiculous. Or mm. things that are not normal become normal. Yeah. Like multiple extravagant vacations a year and um, like building your dream home and just things that ten, 5 or 10 years ago I would have been like, wow, that's very extravagant. Now I'm like, well, this is what everyone seems mm-hmm. to, in this group I'm in, seems to be... This is where they're at. Yes. So I don't, I do, I'm not saying, like, I don't know what the solution is Mm -hmm. um, because it's very, maybe I'm very easily influenced. I don't know. But I very quickly start to think like, oh, like I'm being neglected of something because I'm not, Mm -hmm. I don't have these things. Yeah, right. Uh, the When I hear you talk about things like vacations or uh, cars or Mm -hmm. homes, and again, we want to just be really clear that there's nothing inherently wrong with mm-hmm. vacations, homes, or cars or anything like that. Uh, the problem is when, yes, you start to redefine your identity or the concept of need or uh, mm-hmm. the, the concept of like comparison, and it's just um, super unhealthy. And that's exactly what the uh, Israelites at the time struggled with is comparing themselves to their neighbor nations. That's why they wanted a king initially, so mm-hmm. that we can be like the other nations. And so you have to be very careful to guard uh, against that, whether it's your coworkers, whether it's the neighborhood you live in, whether it's going away uh, for your college student, going away to um, you know a college campus, university. Um, there's just a different value system there. And the moment it starts detracting from your ability to worship God, then you've gone too far. Um, and I don't know, maybe I just know myself well enough i knew this was going to be a temptation do you remember me saying it before i even graduated Mm -hmm. like i'm afraid afraid of this happening Mm -hmm. like when you're in a different economic group things yeah everything gets out of proportion yeah well i mean the part of the thing and i think you have to intentionally choose one of the benefits to us so for instance the school that our church uh is attached to our ministry uh, is like 97% low income families. Mm-hmm. And so it really is helpful that the, the difficult thing, one of the difficult temptations attached to wealth, for instance, is oftentimes people move, they change locations mm-hmm. and they live amongst other wealthy people and they forget what concepts of need are and things like mm-hmm. that. And so I think it's important to, to force yourself to walk in a couple different worlds and recalibrate to what actual reality is Mm -hmm. like yes not everybody lives in a you know million dollar home or anything like you know um but you if you run in certain groups you might be inclined to think that because most of the it's interesting with neighborhoods most of the homes in various neighborhoods tend to be of certain socioeconomic brackets Mm -hmm. right so I, i think one of the ways to fight against that is you have to willfully force yourself uh consciously back into reality um, but wherever you're on, I mean, you always got to be careful even when you're amongst God's people, but the further you get into the realm of people who do not pre- profess Jesus mm-hmm. as their Lord and Savior, you have to be careful about being affected by that value system. Mm-hmm. So, devotional thought three, 
Uh, spiritual growth at 85 years old. Uh, so interestingly, we're not told exactly how old Joshua is here. We're told, we are told that he lived to 110 years old in uh, chapter 24 of Joshua. He's likely, so far as we can tell, probably older than Caleb. And Caleb is 85 years old here, which makes Joshua probably around 100. Uh, Caleb's in, by himself at 85 is not exactly a spring chicken. Uh, but he nonetheless comes to Joshua and reminds Joshua that God has promised him because of 40 years earlier, his faithfulness and trusting God's promise. Like we can go in, we can defeat the Canaanites. When the other spies, mm-hmm. the other 10 said, look, we can't do this. Caleb was saying yes. And at that moment, God promised to him the land on which he was standing. Here he's coming to collect on that 40 years later. And he says, Joshua, I, you need to give me this land. And for that matter, he also adds to it, and I'm willing to get up and fight the Anakites uh, in this hill country and drive them out. So like at 85 years old, jo- uh, Caleb is like, let me go to war with these people and take this land. And one of the things, like you'll notice Caleb never retires. And like spiritually, he never retires. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't retire from spiritual exercise, activity, and growth. Older Christians should never get to the point where they feel like, well, I just need to coast across the finish line. Mm -hmm. Um, There must be continued daily repentance, humility, faith that trusts Jesus alone as Lord and Savior. And there's unique, sometimes unique opportunities to do that in your latter years as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, My question here is, can you think of any inspiring stories of the elderly sort of really driving uh, faith activity Mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, you know, I retire from work and I just kind of coast yeah. in my faith too. Well, my dad is 64, so he should be, and I think is looking forward to retirement in his professional job. Mm-hmm. Um, he's worked for the same company for his entire career. Many years, yeah. Um, but he's also like trying to like, con- he's considering becoming a pastor. So he's a vacancy pastor right now in the assemblies of God church. He's considering like, becoming like a full-time pastor to a really small congregation Mm -hmm. it's like an hour and a half from his house yeah um because there's a need there and he thinks well i'm qualified to do it yeah yes and i can't do both right now and for my sake of my family and whatever and my company it makes sense that i would continue to work here till you know at least whatever 65 or Mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean every time i think about like complaining about what I do as a pastor, uh, I've, I've thought of him as somebody who is, would love to do that every day is working hard on a day-to-day basis towards being able to do that on Mm -hmm. a day, day day-to-day basis, uh, for not even, you know, a a smaller church in Northern Michigan, probably not going to be able to compensate him at, uh, a full rate that he's probably deserving of, but nonetheless, he just really wants to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's, that is a good example of somebody who is like, yep, I'm ready to lead. I'm ready to serve. Um, even as you know, I, I go get higher in years. So, mm-hmm. all right. Any other things on these oh. chapters? Um, do you think that 85 years old for them, 85 or hundred, it cannot be the same as 85 or 100 today. And my theory is because there was less like pollution, yeah. toxins, they had a very clean diet. Yeah. Like I think maybe 85 to 100 was a little younger. It has to be, right? So there's. Like, a- I know it was miraculous, but like Sarah's having a baby at like 100. Correct. Remember, there's fewer diseases then. Uh, diseases. Div- I don't know if that's true. The diseases. Are there diseases that have come about over time? Uh, yes, there are also like no antibiotics. So I feel like if you cut your foot, like you're done for. Yes. Unless germs were different. I don't know. People, so like the average age of, the average life expectancy then was very much lower. But once you got to a certain threshold of living, so like once you get past certain benchmarks, it was certainly this way in the Roman world too. Once you got past two years old, the likelihood of a child living to adulthood is pretty good. It's those first couple of years that's really kind of you know tense um but the same thing for adults then remember when you go back to adam and eve you have perfect genetics and this is one of the reasons this is the the logical argument as to why uh adam and eve's children could marry close relatives and reproduce without any abnormalities because there are no genetic abnormalities at that point there's Mm -hmm. no predisposed like my family has this carries this particular cancer gene that doesn't exist Mm -hmm. 
uh, as time has gone on, as, as we've gotten further away from a uh, creation and deeper into a fallen world, those things just continue to compound. So even as our medicine gets better, our humanity's ability to um, exist apart from those conditions is mm -hmm. like there's just more conditions developing yeah. as time goes on, as genetics continue to get more and more corrupted by sin. So um, yes, I think 85 wasn't exactly what we think of as 85 today. Mm -hmm. You know, so. Mm -hmm. All right, let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for our time in your word here today. As we've studied Joshua, we're talking about claiming the inheritance that you've promised to us. It's not something that we uh, win. It's not something that we purchase, but it's also not something that we're inactive in. Uh, it's something that you have won for us, but by faith we lay claim to it. Help us, even though we will one day be in the true promised land, help us to start experiencing some of the relief and joy and satisfaction that comes in living according to those promises even still today. May it glorify your name. Amen. Thanks for studying with us today. We will see you next time for four more chapters in Joshua.